Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to our end of semester class reading sponsored by Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Karen Ryle, and I'm so pleased to present these five talented and generous young writers as they share with you a sample of their work from the semester. English 10 is an intro, intro to creative writing class open to all undergrads, and we instructors are asked to focus on two genres. I chose fiction and creative nonfiction, looking at them through the lens of modular writing or what I like to call narrative collage. That is prose writing, which is often but not always nonlinear and is composed of self-contained fragments, also known as crots. I use a pretty broad definition of collage in the readings I select for class, drawing from novels, short stories, essays, full-length memoir, visual narratives, and works that combine all of the above. Every week, students write a creative piece from a prompt inspired by the readings we're engaging with. During class, we share works in progress and revisions and offer thoughtful, caring peer critique. So that's how the class goes in normal times. You might ask, what about this year? For one thing, we never met each other in person. That's very strange. As I was setting up the class online this summer, I wondered if we would be able to establish the kind of mutual trust and camaraderie that's essential for a good writing workshop. Would my students feel safe enough to share their vulnerable first drafts and confident enough to offer genuine feedback? Would they be able to grow? Would they become colleagues or even friends? Would there be snacks? Yes, to all of the above. Although we couldn't share our snacks or shoot the breeze between breaks, we did share the intimacy of our personal space, backyards, bedrooms, parents' houses, pets. We shared laughter, election anxiety, Thanksgiving plans and lack thereof, and the joy of watching one another grow as writers, thinkers, and artist citizens of the world. What a privilege it is and what a privilege it was for me to spend these weird, un precedented past 16 weeks with Katerina, Gina, Jack, Shelby, and Sydney. I am so fond of each of them and so proud to introduce them to you. Um, before we begin, I want to call your attention um, to a link that we put in the comments section of the Facebook chat. If you click on it, you'll be able, it's, it's from Kelly Writer's House, it's outlined in yellow. And it says, um, you can follow along with the readers on this document. Uh, we have listed it in the order that the reading will happen. So if you're inclined to want to read along at, with the readers, then click on that link and it'll take you right there. Um, we're going to begin with a reading by Katerina. Hi everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. So my name is Katerina. I'm a sophomore in the college studying biology, and this is actually the first creative writing class that I've taken at Penn, uh, hopefully not the last one. My, my piece is titled, Tell Me About El Salvador, which is my hometown. And as a disclaimer, you're gonna be hearing some fragments in Spanish. Uh, they're actually part of the national anthem. Let me tell you about where I'm from where my feet first learned to carry me in my dreams on the land that would always be my home. Saludemos la patria orgullosos, de hijos suyos podernos llamar, y juremos la vida animosos, sin descanso a su bien consagrar. Let me tell you about the land and how she is always draped in a quilt of green. From her fertile expanse, she feeds six million people. 20 volcanoes make up the contours of her body. And when she shifts in her sleep every couple of years, the ground shakes and unearths our heart from it. Let me tell you about the ocean and how it kisses the edge of the black volcanic sand, their union creating an expanse of floating forests. Standing where the ocean greets his dark, fertile lover, you can watch the day burn out in brilliant colors that seem to go above and under and wrap around you in a final embrace. Let me tell you about the weather and how it's always a tropical, balmy 86 degrees. Six months out of the year, Mother Nature will cry incessantly, bathing the country with her hot, salty tears that imbue new life into all that is living. Sometimes, however, they are not tears, but rather a torrent of water, 
and Mother Nature's heaving chest creates violent winds that uproot the land and its people. Eventually, Mother regains her composure and stillness settles over the country and not a single tear is shed for another six months. Let me tell you about its people and how they always smile. Dark brown eyes and black hair, skin a deep shade of gold from the ever-present sun. Hands callous from hard physical labor will always be there to offer help to those who need it. And what little food is earned is always shared. De la paz en la dicha suprema, siempre noble soñó el Salvador. Fue obtenerla su eterno problema, conservarla es su gloria mayor. Y con fe inquebrantable el camino del progreso se afana en seguir, por llenar su grandioso destino, conquistarse un feliz porvenir. Let me tell you about the food. Delicate tamales that melt in your mouth, wrapped in fresh green plantain leaves. Mouth-wateringly good pupusas, by far the star of the show. Bursting with hot melted cheese, dripping in tomato sauce and curtido, and always to be eaten with your hands. I could also tell you about minutas and how their sweet cold kiss that leaves a trail of bright pink syrup on your lips comes as a welcome relief on the hottest days of the tropical summer. Let me tell you about where I grew up, a bustling, well-established city with acute imperfections. Ardmore cars with windows tinted pitch black snake through the arteries of the city's beating heart. Once past city limits, ox-drawn wooden carts slow down traffic. The beast's horns are decorated with bright colored ribbons and given sweet molasses as a reward for a day's work. Let me tell you about our national anthem and the millions of hands that meet millions of hearts that beat to the rhythm of the flag. It tells the story of the good fight, the fight for independence. The 15th of September of 1821, the earth shed the foreign colors of yellow and red and replaced them with the colors she knew, blue for the ocean that kissed her and white for the freedom she just birthed. We only sing the chorus. Let me tell you about the culture and how it's dying. Native pipiles are few and far between. Most of them were killed by the Spanish when El Salvador had yet to be born and was known by Cuscatlan. Those that remained were slaughtered for joining the uprising against the government during La Matanza de 1932, in which the smell of death permeated the air and victims could not be buried fast enough. Le protege una férrea barrera contra el choque del ruin deslealtad desde el día en que su alta bandera con su sangre escribió libertad. Let me tell you about the corruption and how pointless it is to fight against it. She is a country full of beautiful sights and brimming with potential, but to what end? Leaders speak grandiose words of hope and change, the age old script that has been regurgitated every five years. After they're elected, that same script burns furiously alongside a country that dared to hope, consumed in asphyxiating heat while the arsonists line their pockets and watch. Let me tell you about the gang violence and how desensitized to it we've all become. La Mara Salvatrucha, MS-13, and La Mara de 18, MS-18, claim their territories all over the city. Bright graffiti scribbles on any unoccupied wall space let you know whose turf you're on. Everyone knows the rules. Don't use your phone while you're in the car. Don't lower the windows for anyone. Don't go into known gang turf past, mid, past nightfall if avoidable. If, someone, if something hits your windshield, do not stop. If they have a gun, lower the window, give them your phone, your wallet, your bag, it doesn't matter, and step on the gas and hope you drive away fast enough before they get any more ideas. Oh, and don't call the police. They're in on it too. Let me tell you about how stagnant life can be. Promises made, promises gone. The newspaper headlines haven't changed in years. Some roads haven't been repaved since their original construction. The beggar on the left side of the traffic light has been there as long as the traffic light has. It seems that time has forgotten about El Salvador. Let me tell you about why we leave. A small country feels smaller still if she's all you've ever known. The youthful wish that things must be better somewhere else is convincing. Without a second glance, we throw ourselves to the wind, carried by the sheer desire to go anywhere and everywhere, so long as it's not back the way we came. Now, let me tell you about why we come back, because as imperfect as she might be, our land is beautiful and warm and welcoming. She weeps for the suffering of her people. 
She rejoices in their victories. She is there, always. When the size of the world becomes too big to brave, her small, loving embrace envelops you and brings you back, back to where my feet first learned to carry me and my dreams, home. And that's it. Thank you so much, Katerina. That was beautiful. Our next reader will be Gina. Sorry, I forgot I was muted. Um, hi, my name is Gina. I am currently a senior in the college and I'm studying math econ. Um, and this is also my first creative writing class um, as I think it is for all of us. Um, and the piece I'm gonna read today was for the family stories prompt. It's called, I like it. If there was a fly on the wall right now, my eyes would be following it. As there isn't, I resign myself to banging my feet against the chair leg and watching my pencil roll across the table before I reach out and stop it with a finger. Then again, roll and then stop. And again, roll and then stop. I like it. Hanjina. I look at my dad. There's a map of the Korean peninsula. It all seems like a long, long time ago. I rest my hand in my chin, pencil sitting still in front of me now as I listen to him lecture about some kings or emperors. Oh, I say, sitting up when I remember something. Is this when the guy in the historical drama put on a blindfold and then shot a bunch of arrows and then he threw them into the ground and it looked really cool and then he got them all really accurate? My sister snickers. My dad smiles. He looks stressed. Kind of, yes. Now pay attention. There were a lot of kings. When I was in fourth grade, we had to memorize all of them. I wish there were a fly on the wall. We don't get past the sixth century before the at-home Korean history lessons stop. I sit on the couch, leaning forward until I'm almost falling into the television screen. The bore that rolls up in front of my eyes is gross and terrifying as it chases the protagonist through the woods. Some words are spoken and letters flash across the bottom of the screen too fast to follow. Mommy, I shout, turning back to look at her where she's standing in the kitchen. Hurry up and read the subtitles for me. With a sigh, she wipes her hands on a towel. Jisoo, you read the subtitles for your sister for a little bit while I finish up. No, I can't read that fast, she complains, sitting back on the couch. Just read it yourself. But I can't read Korean, I whine. The characters are saying things to each other, but my eyes can only drink in the greens of the painted grass and the blues of the sky for clues. The colors are nice though, and the boy is cute. I like it. There's a curse and he has to go do stuff. Utterly unhelpful. Eventually, my mom comes and reads the subtitles for me through the rest of the whole movie. I still miss the first 10 minutes. It doesn't stop me from claiming it as my favorite movie. It's always hot in Korea, but maybe that's because we only ever visit in the summer. I don't like visiting my mom's family because Masan grandpa, grandpa who lives in Masan, my mother's hometown, always pinches my nose really hard and I can feel my boogers crush against the sensitive skin inside. And then he shakes it and says some stuff I can't really understand. And it, it smells like cigarette smoke and Masan Grandma isn't a very good cook. I like visiting Busan Grandma, Grandma who lives in Busan, my dad's hometown. She smokes too, but she never pinches my nose and doesn't smell very bad. She cooks really well, and she has a cat sometimes, and if I walk down to the corner store with somebody older than me, I can get one of the ice cream cones where you rip into the paper as you unwrap it, layer by layer, and the radio will always be playing that pop song that gets stuck in my head, but I can never remember. Sometimes there are comic books. I like it. Busan Grandpa doesn't exist. Sometimes I wonder if he ever has. Usually I forget that he's supposed to. This year when we visit Busan Grandma, she isn't at her apartment. This is nice because it means I can keep teddy bear all to myself. My sister got a bear, 
and I got a bear. But for some reason, Pusan Grandma kept my bear, but not my sister's, which is so totally not fair. I forget about Teddy Bear every time until we visit again. But when I do remember, it's not very fair. Pusan Grandma says it keeps her company and reminds her of me, but I don't need that. I just want my bear, and it's dumb that she keeps mine instead of my sister's when she could keep my sister's instead. We visit Pusan Grandma in a hospital, and she comes out in a wheelchair and gives me and my sister each a brand new bill. And it's new new, because apparently the government only decided to start printing the 50,001 note in June this year, which makes my dad mad because she shouldn't have been going to the bank when she should be in the hospital. It's bright and yellow and has a picture of an old lady on it who looks a lot like Pusan Grandma. Maybe it is Pusan Grandma. I don't get a chance to find out because it disappears into my mom's wallet. My sister and I are wearing matching dresses and there's a bench in front of the hospital. We take turns jumping off the bench, holding our hands in front of us as the skirt flies up and we pretend for a second in the middle of our fall that we are Marilyn Monroe. I like it. Pusan Grandma watches with a smile before she has to go back inside. Inside the hospital elevator, there is no button for the fourth floor. This, my sister tells me, is the equivalent of not putting 13 in hotels. Four means death in Korean, she explains. She always acts like she's smarter than me just because she's older. I mean, I didn't know, but it's still annoying of her. There are some things happening and I don't really know what it is or if I remember it all, but Later, my sister will tell me that she saw her dad crying for maybe the first and only time in our entire lives, but I didn't, but it doesn't matter because that would have been lame or weird or something because our dad never cries. There is a warm drink though that I think I remember, but maybe I don't. It is creamy and smooth, made from powder that's sweet and savory. I like it. It comes out of a vending machine warm, and I've never had warm drinks from vending machines before. Korea holds a lot of firsts. Pusan Grandma dies. She was sick. She had cancer. Don't smoke cigarettes. I think maybe this means I get to keep Teddy Bear for real this time without forgetting it again and leaving it behind at Pusan Grandma's house. That will be nice. I like it. I wonder what will happen to her cat. The funeral is, I don't really know. I think mostly that I am tired. It is my first funeral, another first. There are many faces, most I don't recognize. The eternal question, where did you get so tan? America, the sun is bright and hot in America. There's less pollution to hide the sun's rays. You look like a country bumpkin, followed by the ever persistent pinching and patting Daddy's an orphan now, my sister tells me as we eat. That's not very nice, but orphans are always the main characters in books like Harry Potter and Batman. Somebody, a masan aunt maybe, offers me some cider. It's just Sprite, but Korean and sweeter. Saida. I like it. Can I have some more? She says, yes. I sip it slowly to make it last. It's gone too fast anyway. I think I fall asleep against the floor mats. I don't remember falling asleep though, ever. Sometime between being awake and falling asleep, I realize that I don't feel sad or want to cry. I wonder if I should feel sad. I wonder if I would feel sad if I became an orphan too. One time when Pusan Grandma visited us in America and became just grandma for a while, we went out for a walk. There were lots of lakes around my neighborhood and lots of geese living in those lakes. Grandma carried me on her back, running through the sidewalk covered in goose poop as we both yelled so that I wouldn't get any goose poop on my shoes. I must have been very small for somebody as old as her to carry me. It was nice of her. I liked it.
Thank you so much, Gina. That was that was beautiful. Um, before we start with our next reader, I just want to remind everyone, if you want to uh, follow along with the text of our reading, scroll up. I tried to put the link into the uh, chat, but it's um, in the YouTube chat. There's a link that was put there by Kelly Writer's House that will link to all of the um, the reading so that you can follow along if you, if you prefer. Um, our next reader is going to be Shelby. Welcome, Shelby. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shelby, and I'm a senior in the college. This was actually my first creative writing class I've taken at Penn, and I'm so glad that I did. The piece that I wrote is in the style of Bluettes by Maggie Nelson in the form of short paragraphs, which we call in our class crots. And the structure of the piece is what Professor Ryle calls a vertical drop. So it might be helpful to read along because it's all written in short little, little paragraphs. And um, the piece is called Ethics of Baby, of which I will be reading an excerpt, although I left the part that I'm going to skip over in the doc in case you want to read it. Ethics of baby. I will never be plump with baby. A college senior with bad feet and a bad back, my body wouldn't even have the basic infrastructure to support such a thing. I've got flat feet, you see. So flat, I'm not allowed to go anywhere without first inserting my shoes with a pair of orthotics, doctor's orders. I once stopped wearing them for a couple months and developed such a bad case of plantar fasciitis, I could barely walk for nine months. When you're pregnant, you're carrying around a whole human and its house. I feel guilty saying this, but it's no secret. That's a lot of extra baggage. Increased weight bearing only makes flat feet flatter. And I simply can't afford to take that risk. My body just isn't conducive to baby. I hope you can understand. I will not have a baby. But if I do, it will not be mine. I would borrow someone else's baby for a night, a lifetime, or something in between. In ancient China, concubines prepared concoctions of lead, mercury, and arsenic to reduce fertility, which contributed to all sorts of health problems like kidney failure and death. European women between 500 and 100 AD prevented pregnancy by wearing amulets of weasel testicles around their necks during sex. This has nothing on the 1950s housewife, though, who was encouraged by the company itself to protect her married happiness by douching with Lysol disinfectant. If worldwide access to contraception was the global standard, 29% of maternal deaths could be prevented. If people stopped having babies, 100% of maternal deaths could be prevented. I don't remember when I discovered morality but I know that shortly thereafter, I grappled with whether it was right to have children. Why have a baby when there are perfectly good ones already out there who are in need of loving homes? I decided then and there that I would not have a baby without first finding a used one. Baby recycling, I called it. In my opinion, the reasons for having your own baby are selfish. If I were to have a baby, it would be for the sole purpose of generating a human being that looks at least somewhat like me. It would be so I could look at the thing and say, look, honey, it has my eyes. I don't want to use gendered pronouns on hypothetical baby because I do not want to feel attached to it. Ethics the philosophical study of morality attempts to define which actions are morally right and morally wrong. Within ethics are two opposing theories, consequentialism and deontology. Each has a different idea of what makes an action good and what makes an action bad. 
There is no moral justification for having a baby in a world as overpopulated and doomed for destruction as this one. Every year, the earth drifts further from the sun while burning fossil fuels trap heat in the atmosphere, plastic gets dumped into the ocean and the rainforests shrink. That is no world for baby. If we are to live in a world without polar bears, we should live in a world without babies too. We dug our own grave through war, global warming, government corruption, systemic discrimination. Are we going to just throw baby into the ditch? That's no way to treat a baby. How much longer will Mother Earth last? Don't make it baby's job to find out. Consequentialists believe that the outcome of an action determines its morality and that good outcomes are morally better than bad ones. So an action is morally good if it leads to a good outcome, no matter what. Utilitarianism is a type of consequentialism, whereby morally good actions are those that maximize happiness. By this logic, if murdering your cousin Steve would make everyone in the family, everyone in the world happier, it would be morally right to murder cousin Steve. You might even go as far as to say that you are morally obligated to do so. Bye, Steve. During my freshman year of college, I made the decision not to be a consequentialist. Utilitarianism rubbed me the wrong way. Maximizing happiness does not define morality, at least not for me. Much better to pursue morally good actions, even if it leads to less happiness. What equates happiness with morality anyway? Morality, I concluded, lies within action, not outcome. Baby is cute, but pretty useless. Like, for the love of God, say something intelligible. I can't understand you. Twisted up in the trail of ethics, there is a philosophical and social movement against baby too. It's called antinatalism, which is essentially the belief that human reproduction is immoral. As I'm sure you've figured out, I would have to agree. While the idea of antinatalism traces back to ancient Greek and Buddhist writing, the term antinatalist was likely used for the first time by Théophile de Giraud in his book, The Art of Guillotining the Procreators, Antinatalist Manifesto. What a witty name for a manifesto. Let's guillotine the procreators. How wickedly divine. Antinatalists have all sorts of reasons for wanting to stop people from having babies, but it boils down to this. Humans are bad for Earth. They are destructive and toxic creatures. They are Earth's parasite. It's cancer. Here, Earth and its resources are the unrivaled victims, lives in need of saving. To rescue them, humans must do the right thing, the moral thing, and stop multiplying. Antinatalism, antinatalism believes that the right thing to do is to put an end to the suffering of our vulnerable home. And to me, this seems like a noble pursuit. When the antinatalist movement takes off, I'm ready to stand on the front lines. I'm ready to shout, save the earth, don't give birth, down the avenues of the nation's capital. I wanna fight for the end of the human race so badly you have no idea. In the case that it's too late and babies are born despite my request, I would be happy to buy a baby. That's called making the most out of the situation. While I refuse to contribute to Earth's exponentially growing population, I still find it incredibly moral to pick out a baby that already exists that may not have been wanted or may have been born into a terrible system and do my best at giving them a decent shot at making it. I would head on over to the baby market and pick one out at random. You'll do, I would say. You'll make a nice baby. Unborn babies don't need to be born, but born babies are a whole different story. They deserve love and security. 
Remember that babies don't choose to be here and they don't choose the life they're born into. Not every baby is born with a home. If baby is born and needs a home, and if I reach a point in life where I'm financially and mentally stable enough to care for it, I would love to take care of baby. In fact, I might believe it is my moral duty that my privilege grants me a unique competency to look after baby so that it does not live without love, security, and basic needs. Still though, better not to baby. I know that for some of you, this can be hard to hear. I know what they say. You can't put a price on a mother's love. But I do have a price. I would trade baby for prosperity on this planet. I would trade baby to conserve what is left of this remarkable place. I would pay baby to extinguish the parasitic human from Earth's feeble dying body. But alas, I am young and full of definitive statements. To tell the truth, I really hope I can remain firm on this. My moral code has no room for baby, but I fear that so-called ticking biological clock, that little voice inside every woman's head that inevitably croaks, reproduce, reproduce. I hope I have enough common sense not to give in. Still, I wonder if I will be jealous of friends who choose to have children of their own. Will I feel like I'm missing out on the one experience so intrinsically and beautifully female? Am I less woman without baby? I'd like to say that we live in a modern world where people of all gender identities can both have and cherish children and that no one will receive judgment for their choices. But I can't help but ask myself, if my choices will mean that I have failed a woman's duty to be a mother, a commitment so deeply etched within the contract of the female body, without a severed umbilical cord, am I severed from my womanhood instead? I hope not, because like I said, I have bad feet. Thank you so much, Shelby. Before we go on to our next reader, I just want to remind those listening that if you scroll up, you'll see a link um, that has a um, Google Doc in it where you can read the text of what everyone is reading. Um, I also want to say that as many of the people in the audience know, it's it's hard enough to give your first public reading, but it's really hard to do it in, in a sort of a vacuum in a situation where you can't hear the audience feedback. So, you know, um, you don't hear the laughing at your funny punchlines. You don't hear the gasp of recognition when you make a really poignant statement. So um, I just wanna give a shout out to our readers because I think they're doing a really great job of, of reading. Um, and I also wanna ask those in the audience, throw some comments into the Facebook chat and just show your appreciation and love for the really great job that our readers are doing. So our next reader will be Jack and take it away, Jack. Hi everyone, I'm Jack Nyes and I'm a freshman in the College of Arts and Sciences studying English and Fine Art. Uh, the piece I'm reading was inspired by Natalia Ginsburg's He and I and it's titled You and Her. I hope you all enjoy. You and Her. She was born in 2002. You were born in the year where 14 states still criminalized same-sex relations. She grew up watching boys charm girls on TV and wished she could find her Prince Charming. You grew up wondering what was wrong with you for not wanting to charm girls like the boys did on TV. She teased other kids on the playground with her friends by calling them names. Other kids teased you by calling you gay. She talked about boys with her friends. You could never be yourself with your friends. She sat in the front of her seventh grade cl science class. You sat next to her. She watched The Office on Netflix. You watched Congress strike down a bill that would project, protect LGBT workers from discrimination. She talked about her crushes to her mom. You cried in your father's arms after coming out. She heard that her new school had good food in the cafeteria. 
you heard that your, that your new school fired a teacher for getting married to his husband. She wasn't happy about going to a single sex Catholic high school because there weren't going to be any boys and it, was, and it would be harder to find a boyfriend. You were scared about going to a single sex Catholic high school because you had only found acceptance with girls your age. It was her first day of high school. You were walking into the lion's den. She found it easy to make lots of friends in her classes. You didn't know who you could trust. She heard a senior just got into an Ivy League school. You heard a senior was on probation for trying to beat a gay kid to death with, with brass knuckles. She was friendly and outgoing. You kept your head down to stay safe. She answered unknown numbers and found that they were mostly spam calls. You answered unknown numbers and were called a faggot. She never really cared if someone was gay. You decided you could trust her. She was excited to have a gay best friend. You were excited to finally be yourself. She heard girls gossiping at the lockers. You heard guys call each other fags to act tough at the lockers. She learned about birth control in health class. You learned that people were gay because they were molested in health class. She learned about safe sex from her parents. You never really learned about safe sex. She was with you the night you came out. You were happy to have someone there. For her, it was the last day of school. For you, the Supreme Court allowed a bakery to discriminate against LGBT people. She spent the summer at the beach. You spent the summer in therapy, trying to learn to accept yourself. She fell asleep imagining her crush, just wishing he would kiss her. You cried yourself to sleep, just wishing you could be like everyone else. She walked into her first day of senior year wearing sweatpants over her uniform. You walked into your first day of senior year wearing a rainbow pin on your uniform. She knew she was taking her boyfriend to the prom for months. You had to petition your school for months to allow you to take your boyfriend to the prom. She listened to what her family said and decided to agree. You listened to what your family said and had difficult conversations. She was excited to go to college so she could go to parties. You were excited to go to college so you could finally be surrounded by people who accepted you. She felt safe walking down the street holding hands with her boyfriend. You could be legally murdered in your state under the gay panic defense. For her, it's just politics. For you, it's so much more. Thank you so much, Jack. That was wonderful. I also want to point out that in addition to being a very talented writer, Jack is a very talented visual artist. And during the semester, we were treated to quite a few of his um, wonderful you know, visual narratives. And he is also the person who designed the cover photo that was the advertisement for our reading. So if you check out the Facebook page or if you look at the cover photo when the when this reading is over, you'll get to see some of Jack's work, his visual work. And last but not least, certainly not least, we have Sydney, who is a nurse with the soul of a poet. Take it away, Sydney. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so I'm Sydney. I am a senior in the School of Nursing. Um, this is my like everyone said, this is my first creative writing class. Um, I do have experience with writing, but this is definitely a new medium for me. Um, I will be sharing excerpts from a greater piece that I wrote. The piece is entitled, The Moment I Knew I Loved. The moment I knew I loved my grandmother. I look up from my phone, scouting the street signs for a match, Madison Avenue. I turn left, quickly glance across the road for oncoming traffic and press on. The air is cold. It's late January. My feet ache against the concrete, but nothing can stop me. A happy panic propels me forward. This is the day we have been waiting for. The hospital sign begins to peek into sight. Once I arrive to, at the lobby, I pause to unzip my coat. I ask the receptionist for directions to her room. The hallways feel familiar. High ceilings, bright lights, a chemical shine along the tiles. After navigating a maze of elevators and corridors, I spot my mother through the glass and she motions me over. Surrounded by my entire family, there she sits. Tubes and drains and cords dangle from nearly every orifice. She looks up and flashes her gummy smile. Sydney, I knew you'd make it. Your Mimi got a new kidney. The moment I knew I loved my mother. 
We bob our heads, we flail our arms. We scream together, it's over. She turns the key in the ignition and the radio, and the radio abruptly cuts off. Reality rushes in. IS-211 is nowhere in sight. I look out the window and spot a street sign reading East 84th Street. We are parked in our usual spot across the street from our new apartment. Selena sits next to me, her L.L. Bean backpack tucked behind her legs. My mother reaches to the back seat to grab her purse and discovers the puzzled look on our faces. What's wrong? My sister and I share a glance. Speaking for the both of us, I ask, can we finish this song before we go in the house? She smiles. She slides the key back into the grooves and the engine rumbles. The dashboard lights up, the CD icon blinking. My mother twists the volume dial to 28. My, sis my sister curls her fingers to strum the notes on her imaginary guitar. I hold the sticks and bang every drum from the snare to the cymbal. My mother grabs the microphone to take the solo. The song picks up exactly where it left off. It's over, leave it. The moment I knew I loved Muriel. The alarm jolts me from my sleep, snatching me from my dream. I tap the stop button on my phone screen and lay back in bed. I consider the task for the day and feel them flood my mind one by one. The long to-do list sits on my chest, holding me hostage in bed. I organize a makeshift schedule. I release a long sigh and decide to do my best. I swing my legs out of bed and stand up. Selena is still asleep, so I slowly open our bedroom door and slide through the doorway without a squeak. The sun fills the living room, leaving bright splotches on the floor in the shape of the window pane. I walk up to the windowsill and pick up a white ceramic pot. I peek over the edge and see nothing but dirt. I begin to return the pot to the ledge, but stop midway. A speck of green catches my eye. I lift the pot closer and count three sprouts poking through the soil. Muriel bloomed. The moment I knew I loved Selena. Broom in one hand and Lysol in the other, I am armed and ready to fight. Selena stands behind me, cowering in fear. I crack open our bedroom door and spot the flying blob blending into the curtain. We consider the possibilities. Is it a squirrel? A bird? A flying cockroach? We, cho we choose the final theory. The roach crawls across the dream cratcher, hanging above my bed. Selena yells, well, go in there, kill it. Fear swells in my gut. I know she is waiting. My sweaty palms clutch my weapons tighter as I advance into the battlefield. With hesitation, I swing and miss. Dodging the attack, the insect flies across the room and lands on my sister's One Direction poster. Selena bolts to the adjacent room and I follow, finding her at the top of the bunk bed. Before I can close the door behind me, the unrelenting enemy enters the room and zips into Selena's face. She screams. Her features crinkle as tears slide down her reddened cheeks. I have failed. I am powerless. I am enraged. The moment I knew I loved Big Macs. I am standing online with my father and Selena at the McDonald's on Rockaway Parkway, the one down the street from the house. I scan the colorful menu. The options are endless. Burgers, fries, chicken sandwiches, McFlurry. I tell him what I want, what I always want a Big Mac. Before we make it to the register, a tall, slender man with shades, a kango, and a brown suit walks through the doors. My father smiles, knowing the surprise in store. I run up to him and shout, hi, Uncle Unique. He squats down to embrace me. Hey, Sydney. I wrap my arms behind his neck as he lifts me up in a hug. Before I know it, he puts me back down and says, whoa, niece. You should lay off the Big Macs. I promise myself that I will never eat a Big Mac again. The moment I knew I loved Dubois. It is 11.32 PM. I can still hear my mother's voice from our conversation. She's ignoring me, doesn't look at me. I expect that we'll move out of the house in the next couple of weeks. This is why you can't trust anyone. Click. I pause the painful replay and check into the present. I'm sitting on his bed, back against the wall, facing the TV. My eyes are sore and my cheeks are warm. The tears dried hours ago, but a tightness lingers in my chest. Dubois is lying flat, arms propped behind his head, watching me through the dark. I am silent. 
he is listening. He reaches for the remote control and clicks YouTube. Eight hours of deep space NASA footage. Planets, stars, and galaxies pan across the screen in slow motion. Enraptured by the universe, I barely notice the tugging on my sleeve. Come closer. These college dormitory beds are not built to fit the both of us, but he always makes room for me. I crawl across the tiny mattress and sit on his lap. He asks, do you wanna to listen to Spotify? I nod my head. He presses the power button on his Bluetooth speaker and it quietly pings as it pairs with his iPhone. After a quick scroll through his library, he selects a playlist entitled Contemporary R&B. The first song on, on the queue, Get You by Daniel Caesar and Kali Uchi. It's a love song, one of my favorites. I sing the beginning line with my eyes closed. The melody lifts me, sending me to a new plane. I am existing in a space beyond my body, a dimension where love is forever and divorces don't exist and life is a little kinder. My voice tethers me to reality. Kali Uchi starts the final verse and I drift back to earth. I open my eyes and remember that I am not alone. I look down, Dua is smiling up at me. I smile back and sing the last line to him. Boy, you'll lead me to paradise. The moment I knew I loved being a black woman. The main avenue of the richest, widest neighborhood in Brooklyn is packed with black and brown bodies. Colorful signs of all sizes bounce in the air. Black Lives Matter, Fuck the Cops, Breonna Taylor. The humid air leaves sweat on the back of my neck as I march forward with my black sisters at the front of the crowd. The men stand at the back. This march is for us. A band plays drums and tambourines. We clap our hands to the beat and dance down the street. A short woman with long black braids shouts into a bullhorn, fire, fire, gentrifier. We repeat her words in response. Our voices rise and reach the ears of the tenants in the brownstones above. I look to the sidewalk and watch as our audience watches us. A black man rolls down the window of his car and raises a fist in the air. A white clerk leans on his storefront, grimacing. I smile under my face mask and think, the revolution is coming. The crowd turns down a residential side street and the woman changes the chant. As I scream in response, she turns to me and asks, do you want to lead? My heart flutters with excitement as she hands the bullhorn to me. I take a deep breath and yell with all the fire in my soul. Black women don't owe you shit. The moment I knew I loved hot baths and myself. The steam in the bathroom is thick. I flip the light switch sending me into comfortable darkness. I slide out of my flip-flops and approach the tub. Balancing on my left side, I dip my right foot into the water. My skin tingles. I keep my foot suspended as such, waiting for my nerve endings to quiet down. I plunge further, hitting the bottom of the tub and following up with my left foot. I am standing here, alone, in the dark, thinking. I squat and sit, porcelain against my skin. The water sloshes up and over the rim. My body is throbbing. I do not flinch. Now, I feel it all. I pull my knees to my chest and hold myself. Thank you so much, Sydney. That was a wonderful reading. And thank you everybody for these terrific readings. I wanna say Sydney took advantage of, well, in our class, we there's multiple times where you can do a revision of a piece and it's basically the writer's choice. They can bring in any essay that they've been working on during the semester and submit that as a revision for a workshop. And Sydney chose this piece each time and each time it got better and better. Is, am I right? I think I, I think that's correct. Um, and I'm just like, that was a really fabulous choice because you know we all love this essay. I feel like parts of it I almost have memorized now and it was just so wonderful to hear you read it aloud um, and you did such a great job. Each of you did such a wonderful job. I'm super proud of you and I think you're all probably pretty proud of yourselves and each other. So I wish that we had a reception in the uh, dining room of Kelly Writer's House right now. We don't. 
but um, our class will hang around, I guess, and talk a little while after this reading officially ends. And it's going to be available on YouTube forever, um, unless YouTube ends. So um, tell your friends and relatives to um, stop by and hear the reading. And thank you all for coming. And um, we'll say goodbye. Thanks. <laughs>